Hello and welcome to Lesson 7 of 20 in the URSA Campus Breakdown course on Introductory Statistics and Probability. This is Module 2, Probability, Part 1, Fundamentals of Sets. Let's get started. The main purpose of this module is to examine the fundamental principles of probability and apply them in relevant settings. In order to introduce the concepts of probability, we should first consider the notion of sets and how they give us the basis upon which probability can be defined and used. In this lesson, we look at the following topics related to sets. First, we define what a set is. Then we look at the uh, basics of set notation, operations on sets, the use of Venn diagrams, and also working with the numbers of elements in a finite set. A set is a well-defined collection of elements. Each element, in turn, is a distinct member of the set. In other words, sets are made up of the elements that they contain. Discrete sets are typically represented as lists of values, as in the following example. In example one, we have the set A, and it's um, defined as the capital letter A, and it equals the set of, and you see these sort of um, fancy parentheses, uh, enclosing three elements, uh, all lowercase a, b, and c. So this can be read as the set A contains the elements a, b, and c. The notation used to describe set A is called roster notation, and it is simply a list of all the elements of the set enclosed in those uh, fancy braces or parentheses. In example two, we look at the set A as defined before as including the letters A, B, and C, and note that they are made up of letters of the alphabet. Now, any other types of values can comprise sets, as in the following further examples that are also given in roster notation. And below we see on the slide here, set B is defined as the numbers 1, 2, and 4. And set C is the set of, and if you um, have experience with a standard deck of playing cards, you will recognize these as the suits in a standard deck, which are clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades. Another kind of notation that we can use is what's called set builder notation, which describes a set without having to list the elements in the set. So in example three, we're going to go back to the sets A, B, and C that we looked at previously and describe them in this way. Now you'll see that the, the descriptions of sets A, B, and C all have that vertical line symbol, and the vertical line symbol is read as such that. So for example, set A is pronounced as the set A is the set of all X values, such that X is one of the first three letters of the alphabet. And similarly, B and C are described. You'll notice that in B, the, the, the set that was listed as 1, 2, and 4 can actually be described as um, the first three whole number powers of 2. And, and the definition of C is obvious um, based on the uh, fact that these are the suits from a standard deck of playing cards. Set builder notation is useful for describing sets with an infinite number of elements, such as in the following example. Example four has set D, which is the set of all X such that X is any perfect square of an integer. Now, if we, we can list it in roster notation as follows, we can see that we can list that as D equals zero, then one, four, nine, 16, 25, 36, and then the dot, 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 is sort of like an etc which means that it keeps going there's no upper limit so while we can show it the set in roster notation using the dot 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 having the set builder notation gives us a straightforward way of explaining what 
is actually an infinite set. Now also set builder notation is especially useful for describing sets comprised of continuous numerical values, which cannot actually be listed using, using roster notation. Example five is an example of this. So we have the set E, which is the set of X such that X is any real number between zero and one inclusive. Now, a second way of writing this in set builder notation, which is in using mathematical notation, is listed below that. And you'll see in that particular definition, there's a symbol that looks like a sort of rounded E. And that symbol is used to indicate that inclusion, in this case, that all the values of x in the set are from the set of real numbers. And the fancy R that you see there is the symbol for the set of real numbers. So the definition that you see is read this way. The set E is the set of all real numbers x such that x is greater or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 1. That symbol, that E symbol, that uh, element of symbol, is also used to indicate that a value is an element of a set while it's opposite with the line going through it that you see in the slide means that is not an element and it's used to indicate that a value is not an element of the set. So in example six, uh, if we define D as X such that X is any perfect square of an integer, then we can say that 49 is an element of the set D, but 50 is not an element of the set D. Two sets are equal if they have exactly the same elements and no more and no less. In example seven, we have the following sets. We have A is the set of numbers one, two, three, four, five. B is the set of numbers five, four, three, two, one. C is the set of numbers one, two, three, four. And D is the set of numbers six, five, four, three, two, one. Now we can make the following conclusions. We can say therefore that A equals B, set A equals set B, and note that the order in which elements are listed doesn't actually matter, which is why sets A and B are actually the same. The only difference is in their appearance. A lists the numbers in increasing order, while B lists them in decreasing order, but they have exactly the same elements, no more, no less. However, C, set C is not equal to set A, in particular because set C is missing the value five from set A. Now, since C is not equal, since set C is not equal to set A, therefore uh, set C is not equal to set B because A and B are equal sets. And similarly, D is not equal to A because D has the element six that is missing from A. And again, by similar logic, D would not equal B because uh, A and B are equal sets. And similarly, C is not equal to D um, in particular because there are two values in D, uh, 5 and 6, that are not included in C. If every element of a set A is also an element of another set B, then A is a subset of B. And you see the way it's written, um, it uses that sort of, it's kind of a, a bit like a less than or equal to sign, but it's more of a sideways U and it's written the way you see. So what you see there is that A is a subset of B. And then that implies, of course, if we put a line through that, then that means not a subset. So A not a subset of B means that A is not a subset of B. Note, uh, if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, then it must follow that A equals B. In example eight, if we refer back to the previous sets A, B, C, and D, we can say that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, which implies that A equals B. We can also say that C is a subset of A because everything in C is in A. And similarly, uh, C would be a subset of B. And we can say that A is a subset of D and B is a subset of D. And also C is a subset of D, etc. If the set A contains only elements from another set B, but not all of them, 
then A is called a proper subset of B. And this is written similarly to the subset notation, except that the, the equal sign is not included. So note that if A is, a, is as you see here, we have, we have written uh, A is a proper subset of B. If A is a proper subset of B, then B cannot be a proper subset of A. In example nine, we refer again back to the previous uh, sets A, B, C, and D, and we can make conclusions here that C is a proper subset of A and a proper subset of B. And we can also say that A, B, and C are all proper subsets of D. The empty set is the name given to any set that contains no elements. So it's like an empty box. You can think of it that way. The empty set is written using the null symbol, which is a zero with the line going through that you see on the slide there. Now note, the empty set is a subset of any other set and a proper subset of any other set except itself. Because of course, it's impossible for something with nothing to have something else be a proper subset of it because there could be nothing missing if there's nothing to begin with. So in other words, the empty set is a subset of A for any set A. So for any set, the empty set is a subset of that set. And the empty set is a proper subset of any set A, except if A is the empty set. At the other extreme, the universal set refers to the set of all elements for a defined wider collection of sets. Example 10 shows how this works. Here we're given the following three sets. A is the set of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. B is the set 2, 4, and 6. And C is the set 5 and 7. Now we can, for example, define here uh, the universal set as, uh, and we usually use the symbol U for universal set, as the set of all integers from 1 to 10 inclusive. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now we could define U uh, in other ways as well, as long as uh, A, B, and C above are all proper subsets of U. So note, what this means is, any set is a subset of its universal set, and any set other than the universal set is a proper subset of its universal set. In other words, A is a subset of U for any A, and A is a proper subset of U for any A, except if A equals U. A useful visual tool for illustrating the various properties of and relationships between sets is what's called a Venn diagram which consists of a rectangular box representing the universal set U and one or more partitions or shapes within the box representing specific sets that are subsets of the universal set. Subsets or proper subsets of the universal set. Here are a couple of examples of Venn diagrams in this slide. The diagram on the left shows a set A that is a proper subset of the universal set. And we can see that the, the diagram implies that A is within the box, which is U. And so everything in A is also in U. And the area in the box outside of the circle A implies that there would be data values outside of A that are part of the universal set. The diagram on the right shows the universal set again as a box. And inside we have two proper subsets of U, which are A and B. And we can see here that A and B have an intersection between the two, they overlap. And that implies that there are one or more common elements in those two sets A and B. In example 11, we refer back to the previous examples with the sets A, B, C, and D. So if we define the universal set as U equals all of the whole numbers from one through 10, 
then these sets together with u can be plotted with a Venn diagram. And the element values, the, the, the numbers that are in the sets, are shown in purple. So we can see the following. First, we have the, the, the smallest of the sets. The set C has the elements 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then we have the A comma B refers to the fact that A and B are the same set. And A, A and B contain all the elements that C contains, as well as one other element of 5. And then furthermore, uh, th those sets A, B, and C are all within the set uh, D, which includes the additional value of 6. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, with the universal set defined as the whole numbers from 1 through 10, there are four other values in U that are not covered by any of the sets A, B, C, and D. And they are 7, 8, 9, and 10. So what you see is this Venn diagram with the universal set as the, as the rectangular box. And then we have these sort of concentric circles <clears throat> with C on the inside uh, in, enclosed within A and B, which, which in turn are enclosed within D. Now notice the following. Uh, C, we, we can say that uh, C is a proper subset of A and B, and we just use the notation of the, the brackets with the A comma B um, to, to denote that A and B are the same set. So C is a proper ses, subset of A and B, which in turn is a proper subset of, uh, which in turn are, are both proper subsets of D. So in other words, C is a proper subset of A and B and D, and a and B are a proper subset of D. The complement of a set is denoted by a superscript C just above and to the right of the symbol for the set. So we see here A complement is written as an A with the C up above to the right. A complement is the set of all elements in the universal set that are not in A. So in set builder notation, we would write A complement as equaling the set of all x such that x is an element of the universal set U and x is not an element of the set A. Here a Venn diagram is very useful, very helpful for simplifying what's happening. The Venn diagram shows how the universal set ends up being divided into two parts, set A and the set A complement. So the circle, the inside of the circle is the set A, and everything outside the circle in the box is A complement. Note the following additional rules which follow from the definition of complement. You see the first one below is written a complement and then we take the complement of that and we use the brackets to help us out with that. So another way of saying that is the complement of a complement is equal to a. In other words, if you take the complement of the complement of a set, it sort of cancels out to give you the set that you were starting with. So a complement complement just equals a. If you look at the Venn diagram, you can see that if you're not in the part that's not an A, well, then you're back in A. It's another way of thinking of that. Uh, and, and another couple of uh, properties that follow are that the, the complement of the universal set is just the empty set. So if you're not in the universal set, then, you're, then there's, there's no values based on what we're defining as the overall set of values. And the sort of um, opposite rule is that the complement of the empty set is the universal set. So universal set complement is the empty set, whereas empty set complement is the universal set. Hopefully this is all pretty logical at this point. The union of sets A and B is denoted by A with the U and then the B. 
So you put a U between the two sets to denote union. The union of two sets is the set of all elements in the universal set that are in the two sets A, so in A or in B. And it's pronounced A union B. It can also be pronounced A or B. So union is really synonymous with or. Example 12 has two sets here. Set A are the num the whole numbers or integers from 1 through 7. And B is the set of integers from 4 through 9. So with these two sets, the union of A and B, A union B, would be all the elements that are in either A or B. And that ends up being all the numbers from 1 through 9. So that includes some numbers that are just in A and some numbers that are just in B and also includes the numbers that are in both A and B. And we don't show the numbers that are both in A and B, which in this case are the numbers 4 through 7. We don't show them twice. We only show them once. So even if they're in both of the sets that form the union, we just include them in the list for the union once. The Venn diagram for a union, for A union B, is shown below as a blue shaded region in the diagram. So we can see that in the Venn diagram where we've got the, the, we've got the rectangle representing the universal set, whatever that is, and then we've got A and B. The, the blue shaded area includes both the, both includes the areas of A and B that don't include the overlap, and they also include the overlap as well. Now, if A is a proper subset of B, then the union of A and B is just equal to B. So we can, we can represent that quite clearly with a Venn diagram. If A is a proper subset of B, then A will be completely enclosed within B. And so the union of A and B is just B because really there's nothing in B, there's nothing in A that isn't in B. So one way of thinking of that is that A doesn't contribute anything to B that B didn't already have. And that's the reason why A union B is equal to B when A is a proper subset of B. The intersection of sets A and B denoted by A and then the upside down U B is the set of all elements <coughs> in the universal set that are in A and in B. So A intersection B is typically pronounced as A intersection B or A and B. In example 13, we look at the same two sets A and B from the previous example. So here, A intersection B is equal to just the values 4, 5, 6, and 7. So you can think of intersection as being more restrictive than union. Uh, while union contains anything in either A or B, in order to be in A intersection B, an element has to be in both. So it's kind of more exclusive. You can think of you can think of it that way. That's why A intersection B is generally smaller. The Venn diagram below shows A intersection B as a blue shaded region, and you can see it's just the area where the two sets A and B overlap. Now, if A is a proper subset of B, and then for this we have the Venn diagram showing that A is inside of B, surrounded by B. In that case, when A is a proper subset of B, the intersection of A and B is actually equal to the set A because the only part of B that's also in A is the set A because a is entirely enclosed in B. Now, two sets A and B are said to be mutually exclusive if the intersection between them is the empty set, or in other words, if there's no intersection. So we look at the Venn diagram here on this slide shows us what two mutually exclusive events would look like. There's no intersection between A and B. So we call that mutually exclusive. 
Here is a further set of general rules for operations on or between sets. The first two are about how a set and its complement relate to each other. Now, the first one tells us that the union between any set and its complement is equal to the universal set, and that's simply because all elements in any universal set are either in any particular set you define within the universal set, or not in the complement. So if you put any set and its complement together in a union, you get the entire universal set. And next we see that the intersection between any set and its complement must be the empty set because any element in the universal set will either be in some other set that we define in it or not in its complement. So there's no overlap between the two. The next two rules explain to us simply that when you're taking the union or intersection between sets, the order doesn't matter. So A union B is equal to B union A and A intersection B equals B intersection A. The next uh, two rules are commonly referred to as the associative laws. And they basically tell us that if you're taking a sequence of unions of sets or a sequence of intersections of sets, then you can put brackets anywhere within that chain and move them around or take them away. And you, they're all, they're all equal to the same thing. They're all equivalent. So the first one we see here tells us that if we have A union and then in brackets B union C, it's the same as moving those brackets so they're around A union B and we take the union of that with C. Or most simply, we can just take the brackets away and it's just equal to A union B union C. And the rule below it is exactly the same thing except we, we are, instead of union, we have intersection. The rules that come after are commonly referred to as the distributive laws. And they basically tell us how we're, we are to apply a combination of union and intersection. So for example, in the first one that we see here, we have A union with, in brackets, B intersection C. And the way this works is, we take this sign inside the brackets, which is an intersection sign, we put it in the middle, and we put two sets of brackets uh, on either side, and the set that comes before the bracket, which is the A, we union it with both sets in the, in the original set of brackets, which are B, so we have A union B, intersection with, and then A union C. And then the rule that comes after is exactly the same, except we just switch the position, the positions of the union and intersection signs. And finally, we have a set of rules whose purpose is to explain what happens when we take an operation between sets that's in a set of brackets and put a complement on the whole thing. And there's a few examples of, of, of the, this, this one sort of overall uh, set of, of, of rules or laws. Um, we see three examples of them. There's many others based on different variations of whether we're using uh, sets and or their complements uh, and also or also whether we're using union or intersection. So if we look at the first one, we've got in brackets A union B and we're taking the complement of that. So one way of looking at that is to just sort of analyze what that means. We know that A union B means everything that's in the overall um, coverage between A and B together. So if you're in the complement of that, that means the opposite of that means that you're neither in A nor in B, which explains why the right side is A complement intersect B complement. Now, another way of looking at how this works is a, a, a sort of um, straightforward rule for what actually happened here is notice that on the right side, everything that was inside the bracket switched to its opposite. So A became A complement, union became intersection, and B became B complement. Now these rules are 
are, are often uh, referred to as the De Morgan's laws. And there's two more showing here. If we look at the next one, uh, we see that we, we end up with the, we have A intersection B in brackets, and we take the complement of that. So it's the same as the last one, except we switch the union to intersection. And notice that on the right side, we get A complement, union B complement, so every sign switched. Uh, the last example showing here has A complement intersect B in brackets, and we take the complement of that. So again, following the rule that we make everything opposite, that will equal the, the opposite of A complement is A, the opposite of intersect is union, and the opposite of B is B complement, etc. And that's how those rules work. Now we look at set operations involving three sets. In example 14, we have four Venn diagrams, each of which have inside the three sets A, B, and C drawn, which all overlap each other. And each diagram has a caption underneath. And the corresponding area in the Venn diagram is shaded in blue. So we start with the diagram at the top left, which is A union B union C. And that's just the union of all three sets. So we see shaded in blue, the full coverage of the circles for the sets A, B, and C. Next in the top right, we have A intersect B intersect C. Now, generally speaking, intersection is much more restrictive than union because we're looking for uh, the area that satisfies all three conditions. And so we see here that the shaded area in blue is just the small area in the center, which is the only part of the diagram that is simultaneously in A and in B and in C. Now, similarly, the diagram on the bottom left also involves the intersection of three sets, except this time two of them are complements of sets. So we have A complement, intersect B complement, intersect C. So the area that's shaded is the only part of the diagram that is not in A and not in B and in C. And finally, the diagram on the bottom right is a fair bit more complicated looking. The caption is quite long. It's the union of three bracketed intersections of three sets. So what we have here is A intersect B intersect C complement union with A intersect B complement intersect C union with A complement intersect B intersect C. So what we see the blue shaded area is actually uh, the combination of three uh, three separate uh, pieces or, or three separate areas together, each of which corresponds to one of the brackets. So the first bracket is uh, everything that's in A and in B and not in C. So that ends up giving us the top left, uh, sort of they look like petals of, of a flower and it's the top left one. And the next one is everything that is in A and not in B and in C, which is the top right pedal. And finally, the last one is everything that is uh, not in A and in B and in C, which is the, the, the bottom pedal. And then the final answer is the combined, the combination of all three, which we see shaded in blue. The number of elements in a finite set A is denoted by N bracket A. Now, since any element in a universal set is either in a set A or not in A, which is called A complement, we get the general rule that the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in A complement must equal the number of elements in the universal set. Now, when there are two sets A and B, we might be interested in knowing the number of elements in the union and intersection of these sets. In example 15, we have two sets. Set A are, is the numbers 0, 1, 2, and 4. And set B 
is the numbers 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13. So in this particular case, we can see that the number of elements in A is 4, and the number of elements in B is 7. And we get those just by counting the number of elements. Now, to figure out how many elements are in A and B combined, in other words, the number of elements in A union B, we, we do the following. First, we add the number of elements in A and the number of elements in B. But then we have to subtract the number of elements in A intersection B because those are the elements that are in both and we've counted them in twice in the previous step. So we have to m subtract one of those. Uh, we have to subtract that value one time to get us to just including it once, which is the correct number of times to include every value. So in general, the rule is that the number of elements in A union B is equal to the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B minus the number of elements in A intersection B. So for this particular example that we saw in the last slide, there are two elements in the intersection of A and B and those are the numbers 1 and 2 and so that's there's two numbers there, so the n bracket a intersection b equals 2 because there's two such numbers. So therefore, we can finally figure out that the number of elements in the union of a and b is equal to 4 plus 7 minus 2, which gives us an answer of 9, which equals 9. And that's consistent with, because our, our, our sets here are quite small and easy to look at, we can easily see that if we construct uh, the set A union B, we get the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 11, and 13. And if we count how many numbers that is, uh, we confirm that indeed that's, that's 9. Now, if we rearrange the previously derived formula for the number of elements in A union B, we can get a similar rule for the number of elements in A intersection B. So if we start with that formula where we've got N a union B equals NA plus NB minus NA intersection B. If we just rearrange using our usual rules for algebra, we end up with the following formula, which looks very similar to the other one, which is that the number of elements in A intersection B is equal to the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B minus the number of elements in A union B. In other words, these two formulas are just equivalent, otherwise, other than you just swap NA union B and NA intersection B, just swap places. So for the, the given example that we've been working with, we would get the number of elements in the intersection equal to 4, that's the number of elements in A, plus 7, which is the number of elements in B, minus 9, which we previously worked out to be the number of elements in the union. And lo and behold, we get 2, which we already know from before is the true correct number of elements in that intersection because there's the numbers one and two and there's two of those. Now we 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 add a note here that if two sets A and B are mutually exclusive then there would be no elements in their intersection so n A intersection B equals zero in that case and so the formula for n A union B would just um, simplify to just equaling the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B. We can extend this idea to the next more complicated uh, level of complexity, which is when we have three sets to consider. So you see that there's a Venn diagram here that gives us the general representation of a situation where we have sets A, B, and C that may, they may not, but this is that we draw the diagram in such a way generally to show that there may be an intersection uh, between any of these sets. It, including intersection of any two of them and also that central piece, which is the middle piece, which is the intersection of all three. So in this general situation, to find the number of elements in the union of A and B and C, and that's denoted by the blue area in uh, the diagram. Now, it's a little more complicated, but um, if you follow along closely, you'll see what we need to do to get the number of elements in the union of all three. So as before, we add the number of elements in the individual sets, and there's three of them this time. So we add the number of elements in A and the number of elements in B and in C. Now the next thing we need to do is 
because we've also in doing so we've added the intersection of a and b and c uh, sorry the intersection of a and b twice we have to subtract it and similarly we have to subtract the intersection of a and c because we've counted that twice and we also subtract the intersection of b and c because we've counted those twice we've counted each of these overlaps between pairs of sets twice as we did when we were looking at just a and b in the previous example now unlike in the previous example where that's all we needed to do we've got a bit of a problem here i so to speak and that is when you subtract those three intersections of a and b a and c and b and c you've now taken away that central that little middle area three times it was added in three times when we added the individual sets a and b and c so we had three of those which was three which was two too many but by subtracting those three parts in the second step we've actually taken all of the three times that we've counted that area so we haven't counted it anymore we've sort of canceled out that little piece in the middle so what we have to do is we have to add it back in so the final general rule is that the number of elements in uh, in the union of a and b and c is equal to the sum of the number of elements in a plus the number of elements in b plus the number of elements in c minus the number of elements in a intersection b minus the number of elements in a intersection c minus the number of elements in b intersection c plus the number of elements in the intersection of all three a and b and c now, if you rearrange that to solve for the number of elements in the intersection of A and B and C, then what you get is that the number of we get that equal to the number of elements in the union of A and B and C minus each of the number of elements in A, B and C separately, plus the number of elements in the intersections taken two at a time. A and B, A and C, and B and C. So clearly by adding a third set, these formulas start to get a little bit more complicated. And if we were to add a fourth set, it would become even more complicated. And so would our Venn diagram. And um, for this course, uh, we limit our, our consideration of problems like this to just a maximum of three sets. The following is a set of practice questions meant to provide a review of the material covered in this lesson. Question one, write the set A equals the set of all X such that X is a one digit even whole number greater than zero in roster notation. So to do this, we basically just need to figure out which are the one digit even whole numbers that are greater than zero and then list them. So that turns out to be two, four, six, eight. Question two, write the set B equals, and then we have a list of numbers here, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four using set builder notation so this is the opposite of the previous question now answers can vary here because there's different there are different ways to 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 describe in a rule uh, a list of values like we have here so here are a few of the possible uh, correct answers so the first is uh, or one is to say that uh, b is the set of all x such that x equals one of the integers between minus 4 and 4 inclusive. Alternatively, we can define b as the set of all x such that x is an element of the set of integers. So we just use the, the, the fancy z, which is the symbol for integers, and then the comma, which basically reads x is the set of all x that are elements of the set of integers such that x is greater or equal to minus 4 and less than or equal to 4. Another variation on this is to start out the same way saying that x is the set of all integers, this time 
another way of saying that x is between minus 4 and 4 inclusive is to say that the absolute value of x is less than or equal to 4. Three equivalent ways of describing the above set using set builder notation. Question 3. For the set C equals, and then we have given in roster notation, a set of three shapes, a circle, a triangle, and a square. Then we're asked to do the following. For A, we're asked to list all of the subsets of the set C. And in part B, we're asked which of these sets are proper subsets of C. For part A, we list the subsets of C in order from smallest to largest. For any set, the smallest subset is the empty set, and the largest subset is the entire set itself. So we see the empty set first, and we see the original set C listed in its entirety at the end. In between, we have all of the uh, incomplete sets that include at least one, but not all of the uh, element starting with the s subsets of size one with one element. So we see um, we see subsets with just the circle, just the triangle, and just the square, and followed by the subsets with two of the three elements. So we have circle and triangle, circle and square, and triangle and square. Uh, notice that the total number of subsets is eight. And there's a rule for that, which we will discuss in, um, in full, full detail uh, in, the, uh, in the next lesson. For part B, we want to figure out which of these sets are proper subsets. Well, as discussed previously in, in this lesson, uh, uh, any, any subset is a proper subset of a set as long as it's not the full uh, set. So of the eight subsets listed above, all of them except the last one, which is, which is the set C itself, would be proper subsets of C. Question four. Draw a Venn diagram that shows each of the following as a shaded region. And assume that all sets involved intersect each other and no set is a subset of another set. What that means, by the way, the first uh, assumption is that there's 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 a overlap between all uh, sets that are that are drawn and also the second one no uh, no set is a subset of another set uh, means that th that no set is entirely within another set so part a we're asked to, to draw a Venn diagram for A intersect B complement. Now that's the same as being in A and not in B. So the Venn diagram for this would be we would draw our universal set as a rectangle and we draw uh, overlapping circles for sets A and B and we shade in, uh, it's, it, we see here the, the answer is the dark blue and what we shade in is the, the region that is the part of A that's not in B. And that's the answer that we see. For part B, we have we have the complement of A union B union C. Now that can be translated into meaning that we are not in the union of A, B, and C, which really means that it's the only part of the Venn diagram that's uh, neither in A nor in B nor in C. So we can see here that the part of the diagram that's shaded in is the outside of the circles. Part C, we have C intersect with the complement of A union B. Now, we can translate this first meaning that we're looking for the part of the diagram that is in C and is not in the union of A and B. So what that means here is that we're outside of A and B, so we, we, we can't be in, in A nor in B, but we must be in C, and so that gives us uh, the area that we see shaded here. And notice that works out to be the same as um, A complement intersect B complement intersect C. Part D, 
we're asked to find the we're asked to find B intersect with the complement of A intersect B intersect C. So we translate this into that we want the part that is in B and is not in the intersection of A, B, and C. And if we think about it this way, that 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 makes it easy to actually figure out the shaded in area. Because if we start by thinking, if we start with the entirety of B and say we must be in B, that gives us the entire circle for B. However, we're also we must also not be in the intersection of A, B, and C, which is that small region in the middle. So the final answer, the shaded area, becomes all of B with that um, inside that middle triple intersection area taken away. Question five. Among a group of 40 people surveyed, 25 drink coffee, 10 drink both coffee and tea, and seven drink neither coffee nor tea. For part A, we're asked how many people, how many of the people surveyed drink tea but no coffee? And for part B, we're asked how many of the people surveyed drink exactly one of the two drinks? So the way we proceed here is to use a Venn diagram because in a problem like this, a Venn diagram can be very useful. It, it can really help to visualize what's happening. And also the way that we'll proceed in this problem and the one that comes after it is before we actually try to answer any of the specific parts of the question, we attempt first to fill in completely the Venn diagram. In other words, to try and put a value, uh, a number of elements into each of the distinct regions in the Venn diagram. So in this particular case, and we'll talk more about um, the, the reason why there's certain numbers of distinct regions depending upon the number of sets. Again, that will be in the next lesson. Here, if we draw a Venn diagram uh, with two circles and we'll label the coffee drinkers as C and the tea drinkers as T, we can see here in the, in the Venn diagram on the upper right that the sets C and T divide the universal set into four distinct regions. And we've, and we've labeled them here from one through four. Region one is the region C intersect T. So those are those who drink both uh, coffee and tea. Region two is C intersect T complement, those who drink coffee but not tea. Region three is C complement intersect T, those who drink tea but not coffee. And finally, region four is the region outside the circles, which is C complement intersect T complement, those who drink neither coffee nor tea. And notice that all of these distinct regions can be represented by as intersections of either of the sets and or their, uh, either of the sets or their complements. So they're all intersections. And the only thing that really changes is whether or not we put a complement on, on either or both of, of the sets involved. And now what we try to do is with the information that's given to us, we start trying to fill in the regions. Now there's a logical order, generally speaking, in problems like this to which we try to, or to which we're able to fill regions with values. So, and often these, the often, what, what happens in this solution is what often happens. We will often, based on how the information is given, be typically be able to start in the middle of the diagram with the intersection. So because these are all intersections, these distinct regions, we're looking for a piece of information that tells us something about both drinks. Now, we know that there are uh, there's two pieces of information we're given that are actually like that. Um, one is that 10 drink both drinks, and that's actually just region one. So we can fill in region one with a 10. And, and we're starting to fill in that we're using a, another diagram uh, that's drawn on the bottom of the slide here. And so we put 10 into that region. And then the other one like that is that we're told that seven drink neither drink. And that means that's the outside region. So we have 10 on the inside and seven on the 10 on the intersection of the two sets and seven on the outside. 
And now what we can do is we can go back to the other pieces of information given and start to deduce what the missing values are. And there are two remaining values that are missing now, which are regions two and three. So we know that we're, we're told that 25 drink coffee. So since we already know that 10 drink both drinks, that means that of the 25 who drink coffee, 10 are already represented by the interest, overlapping intersecting area in the middle. So 25 minus 10 or 15 must be the number that goes into the part of set C that's not intersecting or overlapping with T. So now we filled in region two with the value 15. And, and then finally, we do the same thing for the fact uh, oh, actually, for the last piece of information here, it's given a little bit differently. We, the only other piece of information we actually know is just the fact that there's 40 people in total. So we're not directly told the total number of tea drinkers like we are uh, told for coffee. But since we know three of the four areas now, all we have to do is subtract the, those values from the total of 40. So that's exactly what we do. So we take 40 and we subtract uh, 10 and 7 and 15, which leaves 8 as the, as the number of people who drink tea but not coffee. And so, you can, so we can see the filled-in Venn diagram here. Once you have a completely filled-in Venn diagram like this with values in all of the distinct regions, we're basically able to answer any, any fair question that could be asked about this. So now we'll proceed to, to finish off this question. So question A asks us to figure out the number who drink tea but no coffee. So all we have to do there is look in the Venn diagram. And really, once we've done the work we've done on the previous slide, this is, this is very easy, relatively speaking. And that's just the uh, eight in, that are in T and not in C. So in other words, that's, that's the same as the uh, number of elements in C complement uh, intersect T, which is eight. And then we're asked in part B, we're asked the number of people that drink exactly one drink. Now that's not equal to one of the distinct regions, like the answer for part A, but rather all of the distinct regions that represent people that drink only one of these two drinks, which in this case, there's two, those who drink just coffee and those who drink just tea. So this ends up equaling the number of people in C intersect T complement plus the number in T intersect C complement, which equals 15 plus 8, which equals 23. Question 6. 100 university students were surveyed about their outdoor activities. Of those surveyed, and then we're given the following seven pieces of information. 51 do hiking, 35 do canoeing, 40 do skiing, 19 do hiking and canoeing, 23 do hiking and skiing, 17 do canoeing and skiing, and 13 do all three activities. And then we're asked to the following. How many of the students do each of the following? For A, at least one of these activities. For B, exactly one of these activities. For C, exactly two of these activities. And for D, none of these activities. So we proceed as we did in the previous question. We'll set up a Venn diagram uh, and we'll identify all of the distinct regions. And then we'll go through the information that's provided and try to fill in all of the distinct regions with numbers, which will then allow us, which should allow us to answer all parts of the question. Now, the only thing that makes, what makes this question uh, a bit more involved than the previous one is simply that we've got three sets involved. So there'll be more distinct regions, but otherwise the, the, the process is generally the same. So we start by defining our sets here. H is hikers, C is canoers, and S is skiers. So that, gives us a Venn diagram that divides into eight distinct regions, as we can see in the, in the uh, Venn diagram, in the Venn diagrams on the page, and they're numbered one through eight. And again, all of these are intersections of the sets or their complements. Now, from the information given, we'll start like we did last time in the middle, 
because we're given the information that 13 do all three activities. So that tells us that region one uh, is 13. There are now, and then the next three pieces of information we work with are ones that give us overlaps between two sets. And then all we have to do now is just subtract 13 from those amounts to give us a missing uh, region. So 19 do hiking and canoeing. So 19 minus 13 is six, and that goes in region two. 23 do hiking and skiing, so 23 minus 13 is 10, and that goes into region 3. And 17 do canoeing and skiing, so 17 minus 13 is 4, and that goes into region 4. Now the next three pieces of information are, we're given total numbers for each of the individual activities. So at this point, we know each of those circles is made, as we can see in the diagram, each, each individual circle is made up of four different uh, regions, uh, of which now we've, we've already figured out three of four for each of, each of those circles. So all we need to do is subtract the right numbers from the total. So starting with hiking, there's 51 who do hiking. So looking at the Venn diagram, all we have to do is subtract uh, all we have to do is subtract 13 and 6 and 10 from 51, and we get 22, and that goes in region 5. Next, we have 35 in total who do canoeing. So from the 35, we subtract 13 and 6 and 4, which gives us 12 in region 6. And finally, for skiing, we have 40 who do skiing. So from 40, we subtract 13 and and 10 and 4 and that gives us 13 that goes into region 7. So the last thing we do here is we want to figure out the the number that goes into the outside the part outside the circles of region 8 and the information we use for that is all of the numbers that we figured out in the steps above subtracted from the total because we know there's a total of 100 students. So if we, if we subtract all the numbers that we figured out that go into the other seven distinct regions from, um, from 100, so from 100 we subtract 13 and 6 and 10 and 4 and 22 and 12 and 13, and we end up with 20, and that, that's what goes into region 8. Now we're ready to answer all the questions. So for part A, we're asked to find the number that are in at least one of these activities. And of course, that's just um, that's just H union C union S. So that's just the combined um, areas taken up by the circles, which is everything except region eight. So the easiest way to do this is to just go 100 minus 20, which equals 80. Next, we're asked to find the number uh, who do exactly one of these activities. Now, looking at the Venn diagram, that's easy to visualize. We want the parts of the three circles for H, C, and S that are only in those circles and do, are not located in any of the overlapping uh, areas, overlapping regions. So we can see that uh, there's 22 who only do hiking and 12 who only do canoeing and 13 who only do skiing. So 22 plus 12 plus 13 equals 47. For part C, we're asked to find the number who do exactly two of these activities. So these would be, we're looking for the regions of overlap between sets, but not the triple overlap. So they, these are those uh, sort of those petal looking shapes. And there's three of those. So we have the overlap between H and C and the overlap between H and S, and the overlap between C and S, which is 6 plus 10 plus 4, which equals 20. And finally, part D, we're asked to find the number who do none of these activities, which, of course, is just the area outside of the circles, which equals 20. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from MRSA Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. 
Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.